Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome to a special edition of He Said What. We are taking your questions today. Two weeks ago, we asked for you to submit questions. Many of you did. You emailed, you texted to us. We won't be able to get to every one of the questions here, but uh, it's still a team effort to do this. So I'm joined by Carolyn and Michael Glazier. So glad you guys can be here. Uh, Michael, you might recognize, is one of the teachers of our group from days past. And also Caroline works with our young people uh, in children's ministry. She's also a teacher of women's Bible studies. So, so grateful they can be here. Each one of us is going to take some questions and we will get right to them right now. But first, let's pray. Almighty God, thank you that you are the answer to every question of our heart. Thank you, Lord, for Michael and Caroline, for the, the chance I have to be in ministry with them. And Lord, on this beautiful day, this windy morning, would you help us to understand a little bit about what you want for our lives? And we pray it all, uh, counting on your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's get to it. All right. Hi, my name is Caroline Glazier, and I am part of the Leadership Institute here at St. Andrews. Um, random, random fun fact about me, uh, I love macaroons and sprinkles and basically anything with sugar in it. So that's me. <laughs> but let's jump in. So Alyssa asked a question and it was about Jesus turning the water into wine. And she asked, why does Jesus tell Mary that it wasn't his time and then do it anyway? It doesn't really make sense and what's going on there? And it's a good question because what does his time really mean? Why wouldn't he want to just perform this miracle? And especially since this was a really shameful thing to happen, to just have no more wine, and this is a week long of festivities, this could bring a lot of embarrassment for everyone in that family. Wouldn't Jesus just want to jump in? It's a good question, and also she kind of asked, well, how did Mary know that he was going to be able to do this anyway? So. We're going to kind of look at that. And when we look at the passage, we see uh, Jesus and really John in his, in his focus on the story and what happened when Jesus did this. He focuses on the hour, the pointed hour and the sign that Jesus has. So I'm going to read that section for you. It's right at the end of the story. And this is how John wants to kind of teach this message. He says, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So this is the first of the signs, and it revealed his glory. It kind of gives us a glimpse of what Jesus' words meant when he said, it's not my time. When he stepped into his ministry through the baptism that John gave him and then began, it would mean all right, people are going to start to have to believe in the works that he's doing. They're going to have to see these signs and these miracles and have to start to understand what's going on. And that authority to do that comes from God. He can't just decide. And he can't let Mary, his mother, decide, which is hard because it is his mother. And he's also 30 at this point. So he is beyond the point of having to just obey her as he would have as a child. But it is cool that he chooses to honor her in this time. But I think that one little phrase, woman, that it's not yet my time, shows that he is under the authority of God at this point. He has stepped out and he is now about to begin his ministry and he needs that first to come from God. Now he may have prayed for a moment, he may have considered it, maybe he just by saying that, that was enough to kind of say, Okay, I'm doing this under God's authority. We don't really know why he first says it and seems like he's going to ignore her and then chooses to do it. There isn't a full picture there. But what we do know is it was really a miraculous sign. And it was going to turn the tables on everything from that point on. And so that moment was crucial. And it was crucial because it showed his authority and his power from that point on. And it's so cool that that part that I read, it says, and then the disciples believed in him. And so his ministry began. Thanks, Alyssa. The next question comes from Jim, who asks, why do we call Jesus our brother? I really like this question because we've heard this a number of places, songs, poems, sermons. 
Here's why it's a good question. Whoops, there goes some of the stuff. <laughs> we'll keep going. Why is it a good question? God commands you and me to call one another brothers and sisters. And as Christians, therefore, we are all blood relatives with each other. It's the blood of Christ that draws us together. But you see, Jesus is not a Christian. He's Christ. He's the one who makes Christians, not one of the things that he makes. So why do we call Jesus brother? When he said in John 10, 30, I am one with the Father. Why do we call Jesus brother when he says to us, you call me Lord, Lord, and well, you should. Why do we call Jesus brother when we know that Jesus is beyond each one of us? And so how can we possibly consider him a blood relative in that way? Here's the best answer I have. It really comes down to two scriptures. First of all, we, we are told in two different places, given the hint at least that we should call Jesus our brother. Romans 8.29 says this. It says, those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, that is Christ, might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And of course, by brothers and sisters there, Paul is describing you and me, who by faith are linked with Christ. And that's a wonderful thing, that we have been predestined to be siblings with Christ somehow. Of course, what Paul meant at that point, I would say, is that Jesus, in raising from the being raised from the dead, is like us in that we soon will be raised from the dead ourselves at the day of final resurrection. So that doesn't quite link to us that we should call Jesus our brother. Hebrews 2.11 is where it really focuses in. And this is my favorite. It says this, both the one who makes people holy, that is Jesus, and those who are made holy, that's you and me, are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them, that is all the people that he redeems. Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Wow, what a passage. Because of what Jesus did to redeem us, Jesus, the perfect human who also was God in all his perfection. Jesus, by dying on the cross, so perfectly redeems you and me that we can therefore be, though we're imperfect humans, we can therefore be called his brothers and sisters. And if we are his brothers and sisters, then we can call him our brother. Let me say that again in just a slightly different way. In our sinfulness, in our flawed humanity, we have no right to call Jesus our brother, but he does such a complete job of atoning for my sins and your sins, for making us holy, that he has raised us up to be so flawlessly redeemed that he sees in us sinless perfection. And therefore, he and you and me are family. And that's amazing to me. So we should always treat Jesus as our Lord, as our master, as our savior, as our teacher. But we also can see him as our brother. Thanks for the question, Jim. My name is Michael Glazier, and I'm with the St. Andrew's Leadership Institute here at the church. Uh, if you don't know me at all, a fun fact is I love to golf, even though I'm not necessarily Tiger Woods. Um, anyways, the question that uh, I got to wrestle with this week was one from my friend. He asked me, you know that passage where Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood? That sounds kind of like cannibalism. What's going on there? And I think I know what passage he's talking about. So if you're interested, it's John 6 and verse 54. It reads, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, if we're going to read that literally at its face value, it sounds kind of scary. The idea of literally eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood does sound like cannibalism. And beyond that, for us today, just kind of thinking that's weird, it had real-life implications for the early church. 
a lot of them um, were persecuted because outsiders looking in would hear that and think cannibalism, and it led to their physical persecution. So the question for us is, how do we read that? Well, I think a lot of us know that literal interpretation of this is not the way to go, it's metaphorical. But I think when we look at the, the broader um, context of the chapter in John 6, it can give us a sense of what's really going on. So if you start in the beginning, what you end up seeing is Jesus feeds the 5,000 and gives them bread. And Jesus leaves because after he gives them bread, they strive to make him king. And that's not what Jesus wants. They were seeking for someone like Moses to overthrow the ruling power of the day that was oppressing them and to give them food. And that wasn't Jesus' mission. And as we continue on, we look at um, them and an encounter where this is happening, where they're arguing about this. And it says in verse 26, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw miracles, uh, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. He's saying, you're following me because I fed you. And as it continues on, he tells them, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. And um, they start asking him, like, we have to work. What do you mean by this? What kind of work do we need to do? And his response is, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who has sent you. Now, this is the key to understanding this. Jesus is trying to tell us that what is expected, what is needed, is that we believe in the one whom God has sent, namely Jesus. So as we continue on, one of the things to note in this passage is that it's talking a lot about eternal life. It's talking a lot about um, the implications of that work for bread that lasts till eternal life. And we see um, that uh, that all leads up to the passage that we read for today in verse 54. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, when I had first read this, what I thought was communion. When we think about Jesus' flesh being the bread and his uh, blood being the wine, it just made sense to me. And that's possible. But I think something that we need to consider is when you read that passage, it says that whenever we take his flesh and drink his blood, um, that we will have eternal life. And um, it's wrong to say that if somebody literally just takes communion, that they'll be saved. So I think one interpretation of this passage should be that when we look at what Jesus was saying earlier, that the work of God is to believe in the one he sent, that for Jesus in this, it could mean that belief in him is eating his flesh and drinking his blood. The next question comes from Anne, who asks about King David, a man after God's own heart. I want to read her question because it's very, very good. Anne says this, I was reading 2 Samuel 3, 2 through 5, where it names the six wives who bore David's sons, not counting Bathsheba and Michal. It is confusing to me, Anne says, that God spoke clearly to David about other things, yet seemed unconcerned that quote, the man after his own heart, was such a polygamist. Does this matter? Does culture trump Genesis 2.24, Ephesians 5.31, and Matthew 19.5-7? What a great question, and thank you so much. And you're right, of all the bi biographies in the Bible, few persons have more sins recorded against them than good old King David. David's life includes lying to a priest named Abimelech, look at that, say that three times fast, uh, feigning insanity in order to save his own skin, that's in verse 21, chapter 21, fighting for Israel's enemy as a mercenary for the Philistines, adultery, of course, in, uh, in having uh, sex with Bathsheba, murder of Bathsheba's husband because he arranges Uriah's murder by putting him at the front of the battle, and then polygamy, six, maybe eight wives, which was not unlawful at the day, but it was not God's design or God's best. He also, I would say, was a poor father, and lastly, but certainly not least in God's sight, he doubted God, and in 1 Samuel 24, it's probably the most punished sin he has of all. 
He doubts God and takes a census of all the fighting men in Israel. The problem with that is that it goes against God's laws for for that experience of trusting God to protect Israel. Wow. So of all those things, how is it that this is, uh, David is someone who is held up in such praise? Well, here's the Bible's answer. The story of David's life begins in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, chapter 13, when the prophet Samuel pronounces God's judgment on the previous king, King Saul, saying to Saul, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler. And of course, Samuel meant David. There are three explanations to how Samuel could say that about David, and yet David did all those horrible things later on in his life. First of all, some people say, well, this is history written by David's people. David was king for so long, he had his biographers write the history. And of course, they therefore did not, um, did not take away this sort of thing. They want us to know that David is a laudable character. In other words, David maybe didn't have a heart after God, but he just had a great press agent. I absolutely disagree with this view. First of all, why would someone writing from that point of view include all of David's sins? But secondly, and most importantly, God inspired these words. We believe that all scripture, for Samuel all the way through the words of Jesus, all 66 books of the Bible, has truth and authority for our faith and life. So I, dis I dismiss that one explanation. The second explanation goes like this, that Samuel was describing David and essentially God was welcoming David and describing David as a man after God's own heart at that moment, before David sinned in all these different ways. Now I have to say, I doubt this view as well. Um, because there are many places in the Old Testament and even in Acts 13 that echo the truth that David had a heart after God. And so of the three different uh, explanations for your question, I favor this third one that I'm about to tell you. Being a person after God's own heart does not mean perfection. It doesn't mean it for David, it doesn't mean it for you and me. We'll apply that in a moment. It means something much different. Because let's be honest, David should have been banished from Israel and by the laws of his day, executed for murder. He was after all a liar, an adulterer, a mistreater of women, a murderer, and someone who balked in his faith in God at moments. Why wasn't he? The answer to that question not only explains David, but can inspire each one of us. The answer is that David is being described here as a man who was hungry for God. And when he sinned, he was a man who was genuinely repentant. I invite you to read Psalm 51, which is David's cry of, for, of asking forgiveness of God. And so when he sinned, he was so genuinely repentant that he asked, begged to come back to God, he humbled himself before God and he tried again. His sins had consequences, the loss of lives, the loss of Bathsheba's firstborn, uh, an invasion of his kingdom, 70,000 different people in Israel being killed by God's wrath and plague because of David's lack of, of faith as he was king. But in the end, God forgave David. God forgave him from God's heart. And David returned into relationship with God. And when he returned, he was that sort of, care, of, of careful lover of God and passionate follower of God. That God said, that's what works and meets my heart. Now here's what I want you to know, Anne, and frankly for all of us is that every one of us could look back, and maybe we haven't mistreated women, maybe we haven't murdered someone, but you've seen in He Said What previous episodes that nonetheless the sins that we have committed are so heinous sometimes that they would should put us out of fellowship with God. They should deserve 
death on our behalf. But when we ask God for his forgiveness, he grants it to us. And when we repent, when we, we are truly sorry for the ways we've pushed God away in the past, he invites us back. It's really quite amazing, and it's the great miracle of our faith. And therefore, you and I can be a person after God's own heart. We can be that type of people because it doesn't take a perfect life. It doesn't even take an ethical life. It takes a humble and God asking and God receiving life. David seemed to have that. And it's an invitation for you and me to do the same. So thank you, Anne, for this question. God bless you. Michael, Carolyn Glazier, what a great gift that you are to uh, our church family. And we're so grateful that we could be a part of this. You know, every question we have, uh, every question we ask is just, it's part of that piece of our humanity that God gave us that always wants to know more, that always wants to discover more, that always wants to explore and learn. And it's something that's wonderful and it's God-given, but let's never make it our idol. Let's never make it something where we demand answers from God. Because in the end, a lot of these answers we gave you are our best guess. And they're good guesses. They could, we could be right. But in the end, God alone holds the truth and he alone has the wisdom that all of us are looking for. And the most important thing, therefore, is not to find the answer, but to look to the one and rely on the one who is the answer. Beginning next week, we're starting a new series. It's called Flawed Masterpieces. We're going to look at some of the unlikely heroes of the Bible and discover how what they went through can inform how we go through life. It's going to be a wonderful time. I hope to see you there next week. God bless you. On a Saturday morning when nothing is going on, what's your favorite thing to do? Uh, sleep in. <laughs> Saturday morning I'm sleeping in. Sorry. <laughs> so all those early risers, good for you. <laughs> no, you're a little bit taller than I am. Hi, everybody. Uh, there's so many nice things about being married to Caroline, it's hard to choose. I feel like that's the right answer. <laughs>